God is not found in commotion. People who seek him in the noisy streets and public places seek him in vain. It is in solitude that God speaks to people's hearts. It is not that God does not desire to save those who are in the world, but the crowds, the noise, and the confusion which people often enjoy close all of the avenues to God. It would be as if God were wasting his words in these circumstances where a person would not take notice of God's counsels nor take time to reflect on these words in order to take advantage of them. talk to you about ways in which you can strengthen your spiritual life but to do this you have to get away from the distractions and commotion of the world and make time for quiet reflection it won't it'll take work it won't be easy but God will richly reward your efforts before starting I want to give you a little bit of background about how this video presentation came into being I also want to talk to you a little bit about myself now please stay tuned. Don't reach for that pause button. As St. Paul said in the second letter to the Corinthians, please bear with me. I hope you'll put up with a little of my foolishness. Okay, so about the video. Seven years ago I was prompted by the Holy Spirit to write a book about my life experiences. This presentation was one of the chapters in the book. Even though I thought it had a good message, I took the chapter out of the book because it didn't really fit with the rest of the book. So I turned this chapter into a presentation. Now a little bit about myself. Words. I always enjoy playing with words. I love riddles, clever puns, and word puzzles. I probably learned this from my mom. Mom loved to work on crossword puzzles and word search puzzles in this I think her favorite was called Jumble, where she would rearrange letters to make words. Well, many years ago, when I was teaching sixth grade math in Houston, Texas, I went to visit my mother in the summer. And uh, she gave me this cartoon that she'd cut out of the newspaper. She told me she saved it for me because she thought I could use it in my teaching. She was right. Here's this cartoon. Frank and Ernest arrive at a stop sign with the letters in the wrong order, thus the tag out of order. The cartoon became my homework assignment for the first day of school that following year and many years after that. The students had to figure out how many different ways those four letters could be arranged and what fraction of those ways would make real words. Now I expected the students to come in with five words, stop, spot, post, pots, and tops. The students came the next day and many of them did have those five words. To my surprise, a few of them had come in with another word, a sixth word, a word that I'd overlooked. Ops, O-P-T-S. Ops is the root word of option. <clears throat> For example, I could say, when Father Peter has to choose between a Latin mass or an English mass, he usually opts for Latin. When the letters of a word can be arranged to form the letters of another word, the word just had to be anagrams. <clears throat> For example, the letters in cinema can be arranged to form the word Iceman, so cinema and Iceman are said to be anagrams. So let's get back to the topic of how we can improve our spiritual lives. To do this, we will explore the anagrams of a six-letter word. T-I-N-S-E-L. Tinsel is our first word. Shining and sparkling, tinsel easy ca easily catches our attention. Tinsel can be a good distractor. For example, Charlie Brown, the cartoon character, could have put a lot of tinsel on his Christmas tree to distract people from noticing how scrawny and scraggly the tree was. Actually, anything that draws our attention in one direction draws it from another. 
Let's look at what tinsel might symbolize in our everyday lives. Those sources of distraction in our material world, they constantly distract and draw our attention. This tinsel is found everywhere we go, in stores, in markets, on billboards, as we drive, in our homes and work and school. It's on the radio, television, and internet. This tinsel can catch and keep our attention in powerful and yet subtle ways so that we accept it without question. We are immersed in, the in this tinsel almost like a fish in water. And much of the tinsel is not even that pleasant. Consider, for example, watching the news on TV. More than 50 years ago, French author Madeleine Dalbrell wrote the following, I quote, we have really had our fill of all the heralds of bad news and gloom. They make such a noise that God's word no longer can be heard. In the midst of this din, may our silence resound with the beat of God's message." End quote. Since the time that that was written, I think we might agree that the world has gotten much worse. There's a new book by Robert Cardinal Serra, which is titled The Power of Silence. In this book, Cardinal Serra writes, and I'll quote, Ours is a loud age, a restless age. We know the landscape well. The media circus blurs the line between power politics and viewing pleasure. The teeming internet jungle is a digital presence that multiplies itself without end. We internalize it, drawing it into ourselves in greater doses until we not only make noise, but are noise, plugged into the agitation and clamor of the world and unable to watch or click or share our way out of it." End quote. In our modern world, most of us want to be plugged in, tuned in. This modern tinsel poses a greater danger than the distractions of previous years. Author and editor Bill Keller asserts that the most obvious drawback of social media is that they are aggressive distractions. The digital world is highly addictive and countless people waste their lives lost in video games or pornography or in the overuse of social media. Television and radio, along with other weapons of mass distraction such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, and LinkedIn, keep people occupied with external stimuli. Is it any wonder that God's word is not heard by most people? I spend a lot of time every day deleting messages that I do not want or need. These are mostly advertisements and news hype. It's the electronic version of the good old-fashioned junk mail. One day I kept a count. I deleted more than 400 messages and the next day it would start all over again. For many years, I would get up early every morning and start each day with prayer and reflection. Lately, I've fallen into the habit of getting up and checking my WhatsApp, my emails, text messages, etc. Then I'd look over my pending events for the day. I was doing this before taking time for prayer and reflection. I told myself that I would pray more peacefully if I could get all these little tasks and chores out of the way first. The strategy simply does not work. Usually I would end up going to bed realizing that I hadn't even taken time for reflection or prayer that day. The truth is, the tasks and chores never end. St. Francis de Sales was a doctor of the church. His books were among the first written for the common people rather than for the clergy and theologians. He wrote a book titled Introduction to the Devout Life. In this book, St. Francis de Sales gives the following advice. Half an hour's meditation each day is essential, except when you are very busy, then a full hour is needed. Counterintuitive? Yeah. But good advice? Also yes. In his book, The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren states, if you are always on the go and can't hear God, you are facing the barrier of busyness. How can we get away from these distractions of our world and find time to develop our relationship with God? To find out, let's just rearrange the letters.
L-I-S-T-E-N. We can rearrange the letters of tinsel to make, make our second word, which is listen. What exactly is it that we should be listening for? And how do we incorporate listening into our daily lives? People have conversations with one another while at the same time texting on their phones or listening to music. They tell you that they're multitasking. They say that their music relaxes them and helps them feel better. But the sound of the music and the light from the screen seem to put them in a trance. Now, while in a conversation, people should be focused. They should be listening. They should try to be gaining knowledge and direction. Much can be learned from listening to other people, and even more can be learned by listening intently to the voice of God. In the Gospel of St. John, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. But most of the forces of our world and culture prevent us from listening to the voice of God. In the meditation written in the Magnificat magazine, Father Tazius Daxer wrote, The created world surrounding us is a voice which speaks to us. If our faith is weak, this voice distracts us, pulls us away from God, and forces our attention in on itself. As faith grows, the opposite process happens. The outside world begins to speak of God, becoming a sign of his presence, helping us get in touch with him, and becoming a place where we encounter him." End quote. Can we encounter God in the hustle and bustle of an active life? Is there any hope? The answer is yes, but it takes discipline. We have to listen carefully for God's message. Sometimes, while in a conversation, instead of listening to the person, really trying to focus on what is being said, I find myself racing to come up with a response that will make me sound intelligent or will help me win an argument. I don't think that I'm the only person who, quote, listens this way. Author Stephen Covey states that most people do not listen with the intent of understanding, they listen with the intent to reply. I know that I often do something similar when praying. <laughs> Prayer should be a conversation with God, but I worry more about the words I'm saying, trying to use just the right expressions. Sometimes I will recite prayers that are already composed for me. Reciting prayers is not bad. My wife and I have prayed a rosary every day for nearly 20 years. But God wants more than recited prayers. While praying, how often do I speak to God from my heart? More importantly, how often do I wait and listen to hear what God has to say? Consider the following scenario. Suppose someone has a habit of walking up to people and asking them questions. Immediately after asking, the person walks away, not even waiting for an answer. Later, the same person complains that no one ever answers his questions. But isn't this how many of us, maybe most of us, talk to God? After we speak to God, we don't even wait for God to give him time to speak to us. We say our prayer, and then we're done. I know I'm guilty of this. Many times, people will pray for something they want. They pray when they're facing a crisis. While praying, a person might ask God for help, for advice, for health of a loved one. Upon finishing the request, the prayer ends. The person goes back to work, back to the TV, back to the computer, without even waiting for God to respond. Prayer should be a two-way conversation with God. We talk to God, and God speaks to us. But first, we must remove all the distractions which interfere with true communication with God. S Speaker and best-selling author Bob Goff explains, Every day God invites us on an adventure. It's not a trip where God sends us a rigid itinerary. He simply invites us. God asks what it is that we love, what it is that captures our attention, what feeds that deep, indescribable need of our souls to experience the richness of the world he made. And then, leaning over us, he whispers, let's go and do it together, end quote. 
An important aspect of prayer is taking time to allow God to speak to our hearts. Psalm 95 tells us, If today you hear God's voice, harden not your hearts. The Virgin Mary gives us a strategy to allow God to speak to us in the silence of our hearts. Mary pondered. In the Gospel of St. Luke, we read that the Archangel Gabriel told Mary that she had been chosen to be the mother of the Savior. And I'll quote from St. Luke, The angel Gabriel greeted Mary, saying, Hail, you who are full of grace, the Lord is with you. Mary was troubled by these words and pondered in her heart what their meaning could be. Mary also pondered all the events that happened after the birth of Jesus. Of course, none of us are the Virgin Mary, so how then can we, as normal people, learn how to ponder God's words in our heart? Well, let's rearrange the letters again to find out. S-I-L-E-N-T. Rearranging the letters brings us to our next word, which is silent. Silence, says British author and philosopher Francis Bacon, is the sleep that nourishes wisdom. If someone is seriously seeking to hear the voice of God, he must go into the classroom of silence. Christian author and inspirational speaker Matthew, Matthew Kelly mentions the classroom of silence in almost every book he has written. Kelly explains the classroom of silence as follows. He, he writes, It is like entering into silence in order to converse with the Lord. Enter the classroom of silence and ask God, What do you think I should do? When you start spending 10 minutes a day with God, you will ask yourself how you ever lived without doing it. End quote. God speaks to people in the quiet of their hearts in a small, still voice that most of us do not hear because the noise of the world drowns out the little supernatural whisper. I have heard this quiet yet firm whisper many times, not because God has somehow singled me out, but because from a very young age I have been comfortable with silence. Everyone is capable of hearing the whisper. It only requires time spent in the classroom of silence. Well, growing up, I didn't have cell phones or iPods, or earbuds or tablets. I walked to school and back each day, usually by myself, so I had lots of time alone with my thoughts. During summers, during my high school years, I would take two or three hour bike rides away from the city out into the country, stopping to walk near lakes and rivers. I became comfortable with silence. For most children growing up now, there are few opportunities to have silent time. The same is true for most adults, unless we actually work to make time to enter into the classroom of silence. Interior rest and harmony flow only from silence, Cardinal Sarah wrote in his new book. The Cardinal continues, Without silence, life does not exist. The greatest mysteries of the world are born and unfold in silence. Nothing will make us discover God better than his silence, indescribable in the center of our being, excuse me, inscribed in the center of our being. If we do not cultivate this silence, how can we find God? Without silence, God disappears into the noise." End quote. I'll share with you an experience I had a few years ago. It was uh, summer vacation in June and Sylvia and I were driving down towards Monterey and we were going to stop on the border to pick up her sister Letty and Letty's husband Marcelo. Well as we were driving before we, we arrived, before we got to Letty and Marcelo we were driving and uh, we were listening to a CD of a retreat we had attended and we heard a prayer on there that caught our attention. It was a prayer that the, the person who gave the retreat had uh, said with his father in the hospital when his father was dying. See, Sylvia had an aunt in the hospital and she, she was pretty much reaching the end. Uh, you know, we knew that it wasn't going to be long and we, we decided this would be a good prayer to pray with her. So as I was driving, uh, Sylvia stopped, excuse me, Sylvia stopped the CD 
continuously and, and recorded the prayer and played a little more and wrote it down and played a little more and wrote it down and real tedious but she got the whole prayer transcribed and then she re rewrote it in Spanish because her aunt speaks Spanish and we had the prayer so that we could go pray with her aunt. Well we picked up Letty and Marcelo and went to Monterey and um, we decided to go to the hospital to see the aunt and Marcelo drove us there and we got there, all four of us, and were asked to go up and, and to see the aunt and they told Sylvia, no, you're not dressed appropriately because we had short pants on. Apparently in Monterey they don't want you going in the hospital wearing short pants. And um, visiting hours were almost over so we were told we couldn't go in. Well, Sylvia decided to discuss this with everybody she could and, and was explaining the urgency of the situation to different people in authority and the answer was no you can't, no you can't, and just not getting anywhere. Now I don't speak Spanish very well at all, so I decided to retreat from the setting and go find a quiet room to sit and maybe uh, just think and pray. And I went to sit down and I was in this room by myself in silence and I got this message in my heart and said Letty have to be the one to go not Sylvia Letty so I ran and told her right away Letty has to go give the prayer to her aunt not Sylvia and so Letty took the prayer and went over to the same person who would not let us through and said you know requested to go see her aunt and they welcomed her in, even accompanied her to the room and, and got her right into that room with her aunt. And she prayed with her aunt and her aunt felt a lot of peace and it turned out to be really a, a good thing for Letty too, I think, and for everybody. And we were amazed because, you know, they, they wouldn't let us go and Letty right away, come on in. Well, there's two things we can learn from this. First of all, God's plan often involves many people, each one with their own part. So in this situation we needed Marcelo. He drove us safely to the hospital and back. Sylvia, who uh, took the time to transcribe and translate this entire prayer. I received the message in my heart that Letty had to be the one to go and Letty went and prayed with her aunt and we all had our part. And secondly, and this is the more important point with respect to this video, um, had I not gone off to a quiet room by myself, I could have never heard the message in my heart. Had I stayed in the middle of everybody questioning and discussing and debating why we couldn't go up and all the commotion, uh, that voice would have never come through. So, so the importance of silence and finding a quiet place to hear God's voice is reinforced. Um, so to hear God speak to our hearts, we have to seek silence and solitude. St. Teresa of Calcutta spoke of the importance of silence and about the need to listen. Mother Teresa said, I quote, We need to find God and he cannot be found in the noise and restlessness. God is the friend of silence. See how nature, trees, flowers, grass. All of nature grows in silence. See the stars, the moon and the sun, how they move in silence. We need silence to allow God to touch our souls." End quote. William Penn wrote that true silence is the rest of the mind and is to the spirit what sleep is to the body, nourishment and refreshment. So how does someone find time to be silent in the midst of a busy and active life? Well, let's rearrange the letters one more time to find out. E-N-L-I-S-T. Here's our fourth word enlist. When someone enlists in the military, for example, a commitment is made, a serious commitment. 
So can you or I make a serious commitment to spend, just say 10 minutes a day, or even maybe twice a day, in the classroom of silence? When you commit to follow Jesus, you will be led along a path of solitude. In the Gospel of St. Luke, we read that Jesus often withdrew to quiet, a quiet place to pray. Again, we'll quote from Cardinal Sarah, who wrote the following. It's a quote. The whole life of Jesus is wrapped in silent mystery. The silence of the crib, the silence of Nazareth, the silence of the cross, and the silence of the sealed tomb, the silence of Jesus are silences of poverty, humility, self-sacrifice, and abasement. It is the bottomless abyss of his self-emptying." End quote. Can you commit to withdrawing from the busy world for just a few moments of silence? Try to decide right now whether you can do this or not. Dedicate 10 minutes a day, if possible twice a day. In the morning, let God help you plan the day. In the evening, reflect on how well you carried out that plan. You might want to keep a journal of your progress. People are able to commit to all kinds of things. Watching the evening news on TV every day, going to get their lottery ticket each day, meeting friends to play cards once or twice a week, going to the gym to work out every day, taking an hour a day to play video games. So why not enlist in God's army and commit to setting aside some silent time every day? Do not let the tinsel of the world control your life. Psychologist and author Daniel Goleman wrote, one way to boost our focus is to manage our distractions instead of letting them manage us. How well are you managing your distractions? In the Gospel of St. Matthew, we find the famous account of Jesus walking on water. Jesus had just fed thousands of people with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. He then told his apostles to get in a boat and cross the Sea of Galilee. Jesus stayed behind to dismiss the crowd. He would catch up to them later, he said. He didn't explain how he would catch up. I suppose at this point the apostles knew better than to ask. While the apostles were out in the boat, a big storm came up. There was thunder and lightning and strong winds which blew the boat from side to side. The apostles were terrified. Next something happened that increased their fear. I'll read from the Gospel. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. At once Jesus spoke to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter said to him in reply, Lord, if it is you, command me to come on the water to you. And Jesus said, Come. Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water. But when Peter saw how strong the wind was, he became frightened and he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. Well, we all know the ending. Jesus reaches out and saves Peter. Then he admonishes Peter for his lack of faith. As long as Peter stayed focused on Jesus, he was doing fine. When he let the wind, the waves, the thunder distract him, Peter started to sink. For Peter, the wind and the waves and the storm were like the tinsel I spoke about earlier, sources of distraction. We have many distractions in our lives. There's the tinsel that tempts us and there's the tinsel that worries us. If we keep our eyes and our hearts focused on Jesus, the tinsel will not distract or harm us. If we get distracted, tempted, or worried, or fearful, we will sink. Remember, we stay focused by managing our distractions rather than letting the distractions manage us. So again I ask, how well are you managing your distractions? Here's a practical way to start to get focused. Remember these four six-letter words. 
tinsel. Recognize the tinsel that is distracting you. Listen. Decide to listen to God's voice. Silent. Devote time each day to silent reflection and enlist. Enlist and commit to becoming part of God's army. Okay, so throughout this video I shared quotes from saints, from theologians, politicians, uh, philosophers, and of course a lot from sacred scripture. I'd like to close with a quote from a fashion designer, uh, Molly Goddard. And she said the following, God speaks to our hearts through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit gives our hearts impressions, thoughts that we know are not our own. The challenge is not only in hearing God's voice, but in obeying God's voice. End quote. Okay, so once you decide to enlist in God's army and retreat from that tinsel of the world, which is actually darkness, and find some time in silence to listen to the voice of God, you have to eventually go back into that world, but you go back changed. You go back to bring light into the darkness. You go back to be glow-in-the-dark Christians. So go forth now. Try to find the voice of God. Listen to it. Learn from it. And then go out and be the light of the world.